All right, Bob. So I was perusing some of our previous episodes on YouTube. And if you're listening just, to this, just right, because you like to uh, watch yourself on video, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Leo, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> and if you're listening to this via podcast in an audio format, first of all, thank you. But I encourage you go to the Beyond the Whiteboard YouTube channel, check out the videos because we want to get everybody more engaged with the comments and asking questions and giving input. So, with that in mind, there was a couple interesting comments or questions that get asked, and I think they tie in nicely to what we want to chat about today. So, first one is from Andrew Z. And Andrew Z, this is on Very Not Random number two. He says, I totally agree with what you guys have to say about cramming so much into a one hour class. I've been coaching for almost a year, and the struggle is real. It pains me to see new clients attempting to learn movements they've never done or don't understand the fundamentals, and I'm not given enough time to coach them. Sometimes I wish we could go back to the start and focus on proper movement. So hopefully by yeah. the end of the show, Andrew gets some clarity, but if not, we'll circle back to that. But my heart goes out to him. Yeah. And the, the second one is from Mark G. And Mark G, basically what he's saying is, this was on Very Not Random number three, he left a comment. Look, hey, I get it. Uh, you know, a well-run class is choreographed out with the warm-up, the workout, the cool-down. It seems like if the trainer's squared away, they have that all down to the minute of what they're going to do. And he's kind of saying, an athlete like me, I don't have strict pull-ups, for example. And if every minute of that class is accounted for, when is my time to develop those strict pull-ups, you know, is it the warmth, is the cool down, is it something I should do on my own, and it's like, et, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully, we get to help those two folks out because today's show can be encapsulated as, what is the role of the coach? Ah, yes. A the topic eternal question. near and dear, near and dear to your heart. That's right, the burning question. What does the coach really do? Other than, you know, <laughs> dole, out the, uh, dole out the advice you don't want to be hearing while you're too tired to act on it. <laughs> one, one, one of the, you know, all joking aside, somewhat sarcasm, somewhat true. What you don't want to be known for as a coach is just shutting the clock on and off as you sip your Starbucks. Yeah, that exactly. And, and I would say the, the second thing you don't want to be known for is just being the DJ. I mean, that's exactly important, you know, like right. setting, setting the tone of the workout. I, I get it. I'm a music nerd myself, but... Or not just yelling no rep. Correct. Yeah. I mean, geez, that's... Coaches yeah, so. are not judges. That We could do a, we could do a different oh. show on, on the delineation between those Absolutely. two Absolutely. Yes, for sure. So, I feel very qualified to speak on that. <laughs> <laughs> so if all, the, if all those things are potentially what coaches are not, well then, what is a coach? What is the role of a coach? Well, I, I like to simplify that and basically sum it up in my mind as clarifier. The coach mm. should be clarifying what the athlete does on a broad sense or in a broad sense um, and right down to, you know, the most actionable, what should I be doing right now or next? So in the broad sense, you know, there are a million different things that you could do when you step into a gym. And I think that that can be one of the most overwhelming things for people, especially when they're newer and they want to get into shape or, you know, they want to change their lifestyle a little bit. It's the blank canvas dilemma. Mm -hmm. There's too many options. So what do you do? And if you don't have a good plan or you don't have a first step, chances are you're going to get overwhelmed and quit. That's, that's very likely. And so the coach, I think in the ideal world should be the one that says, Hey, you don't have to think in this particular circumstance, at least not that hard. Right. Here's the next step, and then here's the next step after that, and here's the next step after that, and the only thing the athlete has to do is say, okay. And that's it. They remove that obstacle of, I have to figure this all out on my own. They the clarify. Athlete, that's the big one. The athlete just has to show up. Correct. Yes. That's the perfect uh, scenario, in my opinion, is that the coach clarifies the entire process. So on the big picture, you know, what am I doing today, tomorrow, next week, next month? And then on the moment to moment, I'm working on a particular technique. 
What do I need to focus on right now? What's, what's important? Of the 10 different things that are probably going to be a factor in whatever it is that I'm doing, what is the one thing that's important to me right now? Because again, wading through that is the hardest thing to do. So clarifying, the coach clarifies, clarifies both the short-term goal and roadmap as well as the long-term goal and objective. Is it an oversimplification to say that the long-term goal and objective is health, fitness, and wellness, or does that vary as well? Well, I think it almost doesn't matter what the long-term goal is. I think you know most people's, if you're speaking generally, that mm-hmm. is going to be kind of what they're after. Certainly, people are going to come in with a specific goal. You know, I want to snatch 300 pounds, or you know, I want to be able to run a mile sub six six minutes or five minutes or whatever. Um, you know, those, those specific goals, I don't think that broadly the, uh, the process is any different. The coach is going to simplify what has to, to happen next and provide a path. Um, when you're talking about something more general like health and fitness, you know, maybe the steps specifically will change uh, or obviously be more general, but I don't think the process itself is that much different. Well, what does that look like? on the day-to-day basis, like, okay, so most people could be listening and be like, yeah, I got it. Like, I'm chasing long-term health and fitness. You're chasing long-term health and fitness. Does, that's the long-term. Now, in the short-term role of the coach to clarify and help each stepping stone achieve that goal, in, on the day-to-day basis, does that just look like you show up and you execute the workout of the day? Isn't everybody basically already doing that or are we missing something there? No, I think that there's like, uh, I'm thinking about that second question and the question about, okay, I I want to develop more pull-ups. When do I do that? There are so many different ways to answer that. And I think an immediate knee jerk for a lot of people is like, oh, well, you need to be doing pull-up specific work. Maybe that's true, but there's also a factor that, you know, general physical preparation will start to develop, albeit maybe a little bit more slowly. Mm Mm-hmm through just the simple fact of being consistent and doing movements that have this high degree of carryover to other movements, you know, these these foundational functional movements. So on the one hand, it's it's about being patient and showing up and, and, you know, you'll find that certain things develop without any specific attention, which is pretty cool. On the other hand, yeah, a little bit of targeted work could help. So if you're asking the question, you know, what do I do? Do I just show up and do what's on the board or do yeah, I need got, to do it? You've got a young coach watching this. Yeah. He's, he's stoked to be hearing from from you with his, as much experience you have. And he's like, you know what? Jeez, I do need to be more focused. I do. You know what? Yeah. Clarification. I'm going to help that when I walk into my class tomorrow at my affiliate. The goal is clarification. What should that coach have at the forefront of their mind? Tomorrow? Less. Less. Okay. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that uh, in, I think it was the first question you asked. Yes, from Andrew Z, who yeah. says he do- doesn't feel like he has enough time to teach people right. he, the, the fundamentals and he wished that he could just start over sometimes. Yeah. In that case, I think that that is a classic example of having too much on the schedule. Mm. You, know, you should certainly have the freedom and the, the feeling that you have the time to explore some of these techniques. If the warm up and the cool down has, you know, 15 different small movements that you're supposed to be doing, yeah, maybe they're not technically uh, demanding or, or very uh, taxing on somebody's you know, mental faculties to figure out how to do these arm circles or whatever. But the point is, is that the more that you're adding into those warm up sequences, the less you're doing on some of these other focus techniques. And comma, some of those focus techniques can be amazing ways to warm up. So they're dual purpose. You right. know, if I am concerned that my, my group does not understand the basics of deadlift position or overhead position, etc., doing that with less weight, you know, focus on position, static positioning, all that kind of stuff, that can be a tremendous warm up. Oh yeah. And it can it can offload some of the need to do, you know, what I call kind of the dance routine warm-ups where people convince themselves that they have to have, you know, 14 or 15 uh, uh, different warm-up sequences planned before they actually get to the compound movement that is going to make up the main course. I think, I think that's a mistake. Yeah, because if you do, if you are spending your time doing that, when the heck 
does the practice component work in? Because you've got to go exactly. from warm up to workout. So there are ways yeah. to intelligently blend those two worlds where just practicing the movement can provide your joints with a wonderful range of motion. It's going to elevate your heart rate. If you're doing it with an empty barbell and you're doing enough reps, you will have broken a sweat by the end of it. And you yep. are you are precisely warming up the exact musculature needed in the workout. You know, So you're killing two birds with one yeah. stone. And then that coach has that incredibly valuable time needed to give personal care and attention to the client because it, it breaks my heart that Andrew said he felt that way. You know, the one, in my mind, what Andrew said he wishes he had, which was the time to teach people the fundamental movements, that is the essence of the coach. Yeah, that, for sure. That, yep. that, that should be what occurs with no exaggeration darn near every day it's this betterment of the fundamentals this betterment of the fundamentals and so if if that's not occurring that would be from my perspective a significant reason to, to pause to take a step back and to say how are we spending our time in that one hour yeah yeah absolutely and 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 I, you know i at the risk of sounding like a broken record because I talk about this all the time, but I really do think that it's a stripping away of the unessential. And if you are, if you have examined your, you know, coaching and your program and you've determined that there are certain key things that are missing, well, look at the other things that you're doing and determine if they are more important than. And if mm -hmm. they are, well then, okay, maybe that's fine to keep them. But if, if you're saying out of one side of your mouth that, hey, this really important thing is missing, uh, and I've got these other things that I'm doing that aren't that important. Well, the, the solution is pretty obvious. You just need to remove some of those unimportant things. And you said before we clicked on the camera when we were chatting about this in big picture, 30,000 foot kind of view, where potentially the veteran coach understands that the role is clarification for the athlete in the short term and the long term. And what gives the veteran coach the ability to do that well is is um, almost, I don't want to say a minimalist sort of focus, but to some degree, and what I say by minimalist is they've identified what's actually important. That's what we're going to spend our time on. And the fluff, I know that it's fluff. We're going to kick it to the side. And you said that potentially the young coach might be a bit more distracted. And that's what can fill up the time, you know, with, um, with, uh, with maybe something cool that they saw on Instagram. But the young coach might feel the need to fill up some of that precious yep. practice time with something else. Yeah, for sure. And I think it comes down to patience. You know, you want to develop anything to a, a refined level. It takes time and you have to have the patience to see that through. You use any example you want. Like, let's talk about, uh, I don't know, building up your personal finances. You know, I'm, I'm no guru on personal finance or anything like that, but it doesn't take a, uh, a genius to figure out that if you want to be a millionaire and you have a normal job like a normal person, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a lot of steady steps over a long time that get you there. And you cannot shortcut that. It's the same thing when you're teaching anybody, uh, you know, a movement that requires refinement. If, if my end state is a high level and I'm trying to jump around from technique to technique, or trying to introduce five different steps for somebody in a single session, I don't have the patience to really see that through. Mm -hmm. And by extension, they won't either. So you have to kind of set that culture yourself. I've got a bit of a, a grin on my face, so I'm going to put you on the spot on something. Oh, that... good. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, better, I'm better off the cuff. So. <laughs> you obviously just, in your role, you know, you present material for a living. You deal with live audiences, at least pre-COVID, like a lot. You handle the tough questions. So what would be your advice or recommendation? Let's say you've got some coaches or trainers that are listening to this. And for, you know, Andrew Z, who asked that question we've been chatting about, might be a great example of this. It doesn't sound to me, I don't know Andrew personally, but it sounds yeah. to me like he doesn't own the gym. Because if so, yeah. he could implement whatever policy he wants and spend the time sure. whoever he wants. So now we've got a trainer that is potentially, you know, starting to get some information in their head. They look at what's going on. They're like, huh you know, hey, we got a great thing going on at our affiliate, but I think things could be optimized a bit more. I think, yeah. I, think we're, I think we're doing some things well, but we're missing the mark on a couple, such as maybe we have a bit too much in our hour class and I'd like some time to coach. How does this young trainer 
go to the affiliate owner or manager or boss and and let them know, ah, I, I think I'd like to have some changes here. Well, I think definitely the way to make friends and influence people in this scenario is to just go in and tell the person in charge that what they're doing is wrong and that they need to change everything. That's, both barrels. That, <laughs> give, them, yeah, exactly. give them the old Todd Whitman both barrels to the chest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's probably not going to be the best approach, uh, obviously. Um, but I do think that most small business owners and most affiliate owners, in my experience, are very receptive to what's happening on the floor with their coaching staff because at the end of the day, everybody's got the same goal. Mm -hmm. The goal is we want a better experience for our members. We want our members to develop and we want people to be you know, fitter and happy, happier and healthier and coming back regularly to get that out of our gym. So if that's the lens that you're bringing this up to you know, whoever it is that is making these decisions, uh, and, and it's done through a genuine kind of good faith exploration of what is going to be the best for everybody involved. I really doubt there's going to be a lot of pushback. If you have um, the best, if you have the best intentions of the community in mind when you present the information. Yeah, or or even just being honest about the fact that hey, look, I'm struggling with this lesson plan. I don't feel like I have quite enough time to really dig in with the members. What do you think about shortening this piece by you know a couple of minutes? W would you be okay with that? Mm -hmm. I think it could be as simple as as that, at least to start the conversation. You know, you've got your when you say what what the role of the coach is, and it came down to clarification. I'm on board with that, and I have a couple other things as well that I think fall under the role of the coach that also help what we're saying, like, like, how do you bring these things up? I would say, in addition to what you said, the role of the coach is also the voice of reason and sanity, you know, for, <laughs> for the flock that you are in charge of, right? Because you've got people every single day that if, like you said, short-term and long-term clarification, if the goal is long-term health, wellness, fitness, uh, in, you know, a decreased frame time, a bigger deadlift, but we want your joints to feel well also, well, that coach may have to step in with so-and-so that's improper or put too much weight on the bar or coach knows that he should scale, but that ego gets in the way and they want to do it RX because that's what they want to see in the dry erase board at the end. The coach not only has to teach them proper form and mechanics and all that, but, but those people are in your care while they are in your one-hour class and you are, you have to be invested in the decisions that they make and make sure that they're making those those good decisions because you are supposed to be the subject matter expert of what is going to be. Hey, don't let them make a bad short-term decision to win the workout today at potentially the expense of what is the long-term wellness of them. You know, maybe they want to do yeah, sure. Isabel prescribed at 135 and they can, with some disgusting, horrific technique, rip it off the ground 30 times and yep, you're going to be able to put that RX next to your loading, absolutely, next to your time but that's not the best thing for you to do as an athlete. And I know that you don't want to hear this. I know that you're a strong individual, but today it's 95 pounds for you. And we're going to focus on these two aspects of the movement. And if your time, you have a slower time because I'm going to slow you down and make sure you're doing it right. You're not going to have a prescribed loading. You might not be happy with me today, but my role as a coach is not for you to be happy with me every day. It's to make sure that you are doing the right thing for the right reasons so that you're still my client and happy and healthy 10 years down the road. Yeah, exactly. And, and I will add as a caveat to that, that I think the other end is just as important and maybe not as likely, but it's definitely a big factor. I think that there's a category of athletes that step into the gym and are far too timid Oh, sure. Uh, and, and need that extra you know, externalized voice of reason to tell them, no, actually, you need to step on the gas a little bit. Uh, no, you need to add 10 pounds to the bar. Don't be afraid to, you know, push a little bit beyond your comfort zone. So I, I think that can't be discounted either, but point well taken about uh, the other end of that, which is, hey, the long term has to be the goal. It cannot be, I just, I win today and that's it. Right, for sure. Because <laughs> because you only get so many of those. And, and then what, you know? And I'm a big fan of, you know, educating people as to the big picture and the why. And now those might be some deeper conversations as to the CrossFit methodology, you know, mechanics, consistency, intensity, why scaling is effective. You know, what does work capacity really mean? And these are, 
I mean, they're all big topics, but they can be worked into your cool down, your stretching. But I'm a big fan. Yeah. You know, that, that should be the role of the coach also, because in my mind, any opportunity you have to make your community a sharper, more sophisticated, more educated yeah. community as to why we're doing what we're doing, when they quote unquote start to get it, ideally you'll receive less pushback because they'll know why we're scaling. They'll know why we're yeah. modifying it in this way, shape or form. And that makes them a better, sharper athlete. And that sort of culture will hopefully bleed over to other, other folks. They'll understand the importance of practice. And then hopefully that makes your life easier as a coach because it's not a battle every day because you're trying to help somebody out, but they don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. That context can be invaluable. And I, I think that it can almost be counterintuitive sometimes because in a way you're really striving to make yourself obsolete. I think the best coaches are the ones that they're, they're so invested in their athletes that after a, a good amount of time working with one another, that athlete is so knowledgeable that they could step away and have almost all the tools they would ever need to continue to progress. Yeah. However, they have enough trust built up in this relationship. They still see the value of that external set of eyes. You know, all of the benefits that's, that come with that relationship are still there, but the athlete is very self-sufficient. I think that that's another like big goal that coaches should have in the back of their mind. And in my opinion, that's the mark of a truly great coach is when their athletes step away and are like complete. You know, mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't necessarily need another person at that time, but they choose to use that other person because of, you know, the relationship they built up. And, and it's, it's nice if you're developing your athletes, let's call it their CrossFit intellect, if you will, to the point where mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you're caught up with another client, right? And you look over the, out of the corner of your eye, you see somebody that has a question or needs a bit of attention, but you're dealing with somebody. So it takes you a few minutes to get over there. And by the time you get over there, that person has received maybe some advice from another member of the gym and you ask them what they said and they told them the right thing and you're like ah oh, like, that's great. so yeah, nice absolutely. yes mission like yep. that's wonderful and yep. and you should have the confidence to know kind of like what you just said that's not you training yourself out of a job you're not becoming obsolete that means you're crushing it as a coach you know mm. you've you've developed uh, a very savvy group of individuals that will have they'll be able to carry everybody forward with them so, you know, getting back to Mark's question, Mark G, who kind of said, I need to work on my pull-ups. You know, wh when am I supposed to do that? All this, the group yep. is already spoken for with warm-up, workout, and cool-down. There's a bunch of different ways you could do that. But when I read that, when I read that, here's what popped into my mind. Like, okay, if you've got extra time, you've got some gear in your garage, well, then certainly you can do pull-up programs. You, you can do some accessories, some work on your own. But mm -hmm. it can be done, and in my opinion, it should be done in that one-hour group class because we're supposed to meet people where they're at. You don't have to just join the CrossFit class if you already have pull-ups. Like, so we should be able yeah. to have a class where everybody's doing Fran today, Somebody's got a sub three Fran, a bunch of people have a five to eight minute Fran, and there's somebody that has no pull-ups whatsoever, and we're all going to do Fran. And this, I think, is when you have to, as a coach or a trainer or a programmer, peel back the onion a little bit and say, okay, the workout of the day is, is Fran or whatever it happens to be. Let's stick with the pull-ups example. Why are we even doing Fran? Why are we even in the gym? Why are we even training? You know, the broadest picture, like you said, the long-term clarification of where we're going with this athlete. And it's, it's to improve these functional movements that we know are demanded of, a, of us on planet Earth to both work and have a high quality of life. So the pull-ups in Fran, if, if why we're training today is to develop is we're not necessarily training today to crush Fran, okay? We're not training, we're not doing Fran today to PR Fran. We're doing Fran most likely today because when that programmer looked back at what they did for the last week or the last two weeks, or the last whatever, what my athletes needed to do today was pass below parallel. They needed to go overhead and they needed to do an upper body pulling movement with a moderate loading and a moderate rep scheme and in a time domain that in general is going to be short and sharp for most athletes. That's why we're doing Fran. We're not doing Fran to PR Fran. If you do, great, high fives, chest bumps.
but that's not the point. The point is the training stimulus that was needed today based upon where we've been. So if that's the case, if we're training because we need to develop our pull-ups and our below parallel, well then, if Mark G doesn't have pull-ups, no drama, Mark. When you're, you know, we'll, we'll identify in the warm-up what makes sense for you. Could be a banded pull-up, could be ring rows, could be whatever it happens to be, and we'll identify the rep scheme that works for you, and that's what you'll do, and it will be Fran ask, but it won't be, you know, it won't be prescribed Fran, but it doesn't matter because our goal for Mark was he needs to work on his pull-ups today. And that should be able to be accomplished even if you don't have extra time to do it outside of the gym within the confines of the workout, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah, my- no, I, I think that's absolutely right. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, you, there was a lot in there. So, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I would also add that, you know, if you're talking more granularly about just the program design of what goes into an hour, um, I think it's important for whoever's designing that to think broadly about the skill that they're trying to develop. So, in this case, let's take pull ups and we say, okay, we've got a workout that's going to include pull ups. So I probably don't want to fatigue that skill too much before they do the workout, but I have a bunch of athletes that maybe don't have that skill yet. Okay, so we need to scale enough so that they can do this thing. And then I also need to serve uh, the fact that they need to develop this skill in the first place. Mm -hmm. And and so then you start to think about what is that skill. In this case, a pull-up. All I'm using is my upper body to try to elevate myself uh, up and down. And that's it, pretty much, right? From a hanging position off the ground. That's kind of the goal. Okay, so if we're thinking about pull-up in that kind of broad sense, well, there's lots of different ways that we can push that forward depending on where the athlete is. If you have an advanced person who's already got that skill and the goal is more, you know, I can do a couple pull-ups, but I want to do more. Mm -hmm. All right, well, then it's finding an effort that is sub-maximal but repeatable and getting some reps in. That doesn't change just because the level of skill that I'm working at is a little bit lower. So, for example, I don't have pull-ups, but I want to get them okay, I need to find another upper body exercise that is pulling my mass off of Mm -hmm. the ground, maybe supported with the legs a little bit. That's fine. Uh, And I need to find a sub-maximal effort that can be repeated, but is challenging enough that it pushes the needle forward. And so that's where like kind of a basic understanding of strength training and rep ranges can make a difference. You know, if this is something that I can just sit there and blast out 20, 30 reps, well, the challenge is not adequate to really push things forward. If I can only get one shaky rep, Mm -hmm. well, the challenge is too much for it to really be effective. So I need that sweet spot, you know, somewhere probably less than 10 reps and more than three or four, I would say, is kind of the the sweet spot. That's why fives are so popular in in strength training is they really really do intersect that kind of sweet spot between enough challenge but enough repetition. So, okay, then it becomes a game of what can I uh, offer those athletes, regardless of where they happen to sit al- among the spectrum, of uh, you know what's a pulling exercise that they can get for five to ten reps for a couple of sets, and add that in, and that can be everybody's pull-up work. It doesn't matter where you're starting or where you currently are. That's what we do as a group, you know. And then it's just the trainer's job to come up with those kind of categorizations based on the population they're working with. If they have a group that has like a pretty narrow strata of athletes, well, maybe it's just like, okay, sets and reps, hop on the bar and go. Mm-hmm. If you're working with a wider range of athletes with, uh, you know, differences of skill, then you're probably going to have to lay out three or four exercises and tell people which ones to go to. You know? And I also would say in, in my ideal world, the trainer running that class knows the people, you know, he or she sees them every yeah. day. The workout of the day is Fran. I would want my trainer to see that as a ball of clay that they have the authority to mold as needed. So, for example, don't consider it sacrilegious if now the version of Fran that makes sense for Mark isn't a 21-15-9. Who cares? He's still doing thrusters and pull-ups. Like you said, there's some rep ranges which are wonderful for building strength. So maybe we're going to get Mark to 45 repetitions, which is a 21-15-9 rep scheme. But Mark's workout looks like 
nine rounds of five and five. He's going to be do nine sure. rounds of five yeah. thrusters and five pull-ups. Because you know what? He can handle fives. But if I have him do a 21-15-9, no way. It's two big yeah. sets. He's going to do three or four. Look up the bar for two minutes. Do another double. No good. So he could be nine rounds of five and five is fine. Five rounds of nine and nine. Seven rounds of seven and seven, even though that comes out to, I know, 49 reps. But <laughs> sevens are a wonderful rep scheme. But... But that also paints into the bigger picture, like seven rounds of seven and seven is beautiful, but it's a different rep scheme than Fran. And I think some people would be like, well, I can't, it's, it's, it's a different rep scheme, so I can't do that. And it comes out to four more repetitions of each movement. Who cares? Yeah. The goal yeah. is to develop the general movement patterns that we we're trying to develop today. Or potentially, maybe Mark could do a 21-15-9 but what we're going to have set for him is there's a band on his pull-up bar and he can do the first six out of the 21. And then, like you said, we're going to make sure that band isn't too much help, that he's going to be able to get the remainder of that set of 21, but he's still going to have to break it up twice. Like it's two tough, challenging yeah. sets and so on and so forth. So I would want the trainers to, again, you're running the class, you know what Mark needs and if you understand the general intent of why we're doing the workout, it's not to brag about your friend time, although that's cool. It's to develop certain characteristics or you know, certain movement patterns in athletes. And you've got a lot of wiggle room as to how to do that. Yeah. So and, and, and I'll take that, that one step further from kind of the, the workout program design is that anytime there's something that's on paper, that's really all it is, is a tool or a mechanism to try to get to that end state. It is not there to check the boxes so that you have the boxes checked. Mm -hmm. uh, there, that will have to be adapted on the fly in many cases. And I think that, again, if you enter into it with good faith of, I think this is going to be what this athlete needs in the moment, and it's off script a little bit, I don't think anybody's going to be upset by that. Yep. So... You know, and, that's, that's a big one. And, and, and I got, sorry, I got, I got one more thing to say in there too. And that ahead. is, you know, from the, from the athlete side, I really do think like everything that we just talked about is really important, but there is also a tendency to think that I have to do specific work on every specific skill in order to get good at all those specific skills. And that sometimes can be just the mark of impatience again on the athlete side. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things are just going to take some time. You don't necessarily have to be doing that targeted work for that thing. If you're seeing your other uh, times and other skills improving and you're making progress overall generally, just give it some more time. If that's not the case, well, then maybe you need to look under the hood a little bit more closely. And that it's so funny because that point might be lost today, right? And, and yeah. We could do a whole episode on impatience. But Myself and all of my knucklehead friends that we started doing CrossFit at the same time together with no capacity, you know, we came from a buys and tries background. So there was no capacity at snatching, overhead squatting. We didn't even deadlift, um, ring muscle up, kipping, nothing. We had nothing. And all of it just by modifying the workout of the day and not doing anything additional, literally nothing additional all of those skills developed, but like you said, it just took time. You know, but yep. back then, before Instagram and all that, we didn't know that we were expected to be ninjas in two months. So we we didn't <laughs> we didn't try. It was okay that it was okay that this took a long time. And you know, there are some things that I remember we used to say at the level one seminar that would shock people on the timeline. And that was something like, for example, if you didn't come from um, an athletic background that demanded the neurological components and like explosive hip opening and things like that to truly learn how to use your hips to manipulate external objects for some people it could be we used to say a three to five year odyssey and people would say three yeah. to five years I, I thought this was was going to take me a couple months like no 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 it, it it takes the time that it takes um and rushing it usually doesn't yield what you hope that it will yield yeah, or, or it does, um, but it's uh, easy come, easy go. You sure. build up to a point where you're like, yes, I can do X number of pull-ups. I've checked that one off the, the, the board. But then you stop doing that specific work, and four months later, your baseline isn't really much higher than it was previously. So, you know, sometimes you have to, 
you have to take a look at the big picture and determine, is this something that I have as a pet expectation? And that's fine. You know, we mm -hmm. all have them. Um, but just make sure that you've done that kind of self-assessment before you start thinking about all this external work that I quote should be doing. And that can also be helpful to have the coach, right? The coach will exactly. ideally, ideally yep. have the clarity to make sure you yep. are on the path that you should. So, yeah, Andrew, and, and oh, well, and, sorry, sorry, okay, <laughs> keep button in. Uh, uh, and that coach should be um, a resource that's trusted enough that in that case, the athlete can come forward and say, hey, I think I'm concerned about my pull-ups. And the coach can, again, with a good, uh, you know, good faith conversation, start to talk about like, hey, you know what? I think we got enough work happening on these pull-ups right now. Stay the course, it's gonna be fine. Or, hey, you know what? I think you're right. This is something you're really struggling with. Here's some extra stuff we can do to fix it. Mm -hmm. the, so. voice, the voice of reason. Yeah. So hopefully, Andrew, Mark, I hope we gave you some sort of clarity with your, your questions. And it's my encouragement. Again, if you're listening to this in an, just an audio format, I would love everybody get engaged with those comments on the Beyond the Whiteboard YouTube channel. Go to the show. And if you have other thoughts and feelings, agree, disagree with what we said, do you identify the role of a coach as something completely different? Are there some little nuggets that we missed and we should add in? And hopefully everybody watching this and enjoying this, we can all share ideas. And in the process, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So that's the goal. Appreciate it, Boz. And uh, until next time.